Lord Pearson has been a vocal critic of the Islamic ideology and he's repeatedly used his seat in the House of Lords to question the government on their reluctance to tackle the social and the political issues surrounding the religion. He is a life peer who entered the UK Parliament's House of Lords for his anti-corruption stance against the insurance industry. He's done extensive work campaigning and fundraising for people with learning difficulties and he's the co-founder of a pro-free trade think tank. Following the exposure of another Rotherham scale grooming gang scandal, he took the opportunity to once again question the government on what they intend to do about the problem of Muslim grooming gangs. And he wanted to ask them if we are even allowed to talk about Islam in the UK. These girls are usually raped several times a day. And so if we accept the views of our lead police officer for child protection, of Rotherham's MP, and of the recent Jay and Quilliam reports, we seem to be looking at millions of rapes of white and Sikh girls by Muslim men, only 222 of whom have been convicted since 2005. So, my lords, will the government ask our Muslim leaders whether the perpetrators can claim that their behaviour is sanctioned in the Quran and to issue a fatwa against it? And second, my lords, will the government encourage a national debate about the various interpretations of Islam? Can we talk about Islam without being accused of hate crime? I was in the House of Lords to witness the political establishment's response to his questions. So I've sat down afterwards with him to talk in more detail about what needs to be done to tackle the problems Islamic immigration has brought to the UK. So Lord Pearson, you're one of the only voices in the House of Lords who I've ever seen talk about Islam. Why do you think so few people are talking about the Islamisation of Britain? Well, remember, the House of Lords, I mean, is a very Europhile place, but of course it's also a very Islamophile place. And people like, those, like the, the people in the House of Lords are completely out of touch with what I call real people. They call them ordinary people. But with real people and the sort of lives they have to lead, in this instance, um, because of the encroachment of Islam on our culture and civilization, And they're out of touch with it. We are, on the whole, a very tolerant nation and all the rest of it. And they see the vast majority of Muslims as nice, peaceful people at the moment. And they find it very hard to think that they can have anything to do with the Islamists and, and, and the grooming gang people and all the rest of it. So they just shut their minds off. And anyone who tries to talk about it is immediately accused of hate crime. That's what I want to ask you next. Mm. When you've tried to raise the issue, mm. what sort of reaction have you had? Well, the reaction is very negative. Um, it's even been said that um, I shouldn't be allowed to ask these questions in the House of Lords, that I'm endangering the security of the Palace of Westminster by asking these questions. Because I've asked lots uh, over the years and things. Uh. And. Um, Sorry, you so they've said, they've said by, by you asking questions, asking questions yeah. simply about Islam, you're endangering the security of the palace. Yeah, that has been said. So because of that, you should not ask her questions. Well, in, no, it's, that's sort of in, in the background. But the, 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 the main criticism is that this is hate crime. Um, as soon as you, you can say what you like about Christianity. You can say what you like about the virgin birth, the miracles uh, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And nobody gives a damn, quite frankly. Uh, you certainly don't get the bishops jumping up and down or anyone. Uh, you can say what you like about the Hindu gods. You can say, but as soon as you touch Islam and you begin to wonder whether uh, Muhammad was such a peaceful um, person, a character, uh, peace be upon him. Uh, and, and, and as soon as you, um, uh, as, as soon as you begin to look into the history of the thing a bit, um, uh, all hell breaks loose and, and, and you're completely ostracised and everyone's very angry with you. Which is what I want to do. I want the whole of this thing to start, we've got to start talking about Islam. Um, you know, perhaps for instance the absolute basic tenets of Islam, um, which are difficult words, so I hope people aren't too bored, but one of them is abrogation or cancellation, whereby the later violent verses 
of the Quran, the verses of the sword, cancel the earlier ones. The peaceful ones. The, the peaceful ones, yeah, of which there are very few. But anyway, um, the um, example of the Prophet Muhammad, after he moved to Medina in, 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 in 622 from, from Mecca, and he gradually expanded his religion and became um, so powerful that in the end he could say to the, his multicultural, multi-faith hosts in Medina, look, either you join my religion um, or you go into exile or uh, I'll allow some of you to pay a tax, but I'm going to kill, kill the rest of you if you don't join. And he killed 600 Jews in one afternoon. And uh, Islam then went on to conquer most of the known world. Uh, and the Crusades were clearly, historically, a response to 400 years of Muslim aggression. And yet we're told that this is a religion of peace. I, I don't know, is it? But let's talk about it. So do, do you think it's a lack of knowledge on behalf of people within the yeah. establishment? Yeah. Or do you think they're aware of the problem, but they don't know how to deal with it? It is so obvious to them that Islam must be a religion of peace, that they are not prepared to look at whether it might not be, or whether at least the, 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 the jihadists and the terrorists and the grooming gang people can use what is in the Quran, which is why I asked for a, a conference on the interpretation of the Quran. It is all there in black and white. And how do we, uh, how do we get rid of it? How do we say it's not there? Well, we have to talk about it. And they have to say that. The Muslims have to set up a great cons uh, conference, a council. And they could, our Muslim leaders can say, this grooming gang, we put a fatwa, anyone who does this grooming gang stuff is cast out of Islam. It's about the only thing these, Mus these, these Islamists fear, is being cast out of Islam. Well, when we look through the whole history of grooming, we see that no, there's not been one report from a fellow Muslim on their, on their fellow members no. of their community. They, they won't talk it. about it. They won't talk about it. And I have tried, I mean, over the years, I mean, three or four years ago and four or five years ago, I did manage to get a, a, a group of very top Muslims to agree to meet in, in private and to go into this sort of area and say we need a new kind of Islam. We, we cannot go along with abrogation, taqiyya and al hijra um, and we're going to change it. But it never happened because they all got so frightened before they were supposed to meet that they never turned up. <laughs> so we've got a job on our hands, I'm afraid, because the only they can do it. It can only done from, be done from within Islam. Why do you think, bearing in mind all the grooming gang scandals which you spoke about today, when we see reports that show complete police failures, government failures, social service failures, why do you think none of those people have been brought to justice? None of the people who facilitated and accommodated these were these ways. Because they, they would say that they avoided being guilty of racism. Racism is this blanket word which is chucked around and as soon as you're accused of being a racist, they, those police people and the people who should, the police and the social workers, who now, who now should be pop, um, prosecuted, um, which is in my question, um, will all have believed that they couldn't do anything about this because of the sensitivities of, 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 of the Muslim community. And then if they did go into it, they would be accused of racism. And racism is idiotic in this context because Islam is on ev in every race on the planet. Uh, and um, so it isn't racism, whatever else it is. The political and the cultural elite seem to be ramping up their rhetoric on people like me. Just a, a, and what I say. Now, just this week, we've seen two journalists. We've seen an American journalist detained and held for days and deported because she was coming to interview me. We've seen a Canadian journalist who's just been refused entry and deported today as well. Where do you see this leading? Where do you see this sort? Where do you see the government response and the establishment response? Where do you see this heading? Well, unless we can somehow start being allowed to talk about Islam, that's the first step. If we can talk about it and understand it, then we might get somewhere with persuading the people who um, treat you as they do, and, uh, and I think it will get worse. And, and you have been a naughty boy, Tommy, in the, in the past. You have quite often. Uh, being a naughty boy uh, and so in a way then it's it's sort of made easier for them to demonize you but anyone who read your book um, Enemy of the State I think would take a different view of you yeah. <laughs> but they don't bother to read that of course yeah. they don't um, like this book out now from this wretched girl which is called Please Let Me Go That's um, one of the great things why don't they read that then they might understand something but it's 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 a sort of blanket um, establishment position that isn't going to look at anything smelly down there. That's what it is.
What do you think it's going to take for the people in Westminster to wake up to what's happening? Well, they won't wake up until it's too late, because I think we're on our way to riots. Um, I would have thought we're on with, with the, um, uh, the frustration which is growing from the, principally the white working class who've had to put up with all, all the discrimination against them, the schools, the housing lists, etc. Um, I don't know, the police not arresting a Muslim man in a beard on a, not on a handheld thing while driving a car. I mean, masses of it. They have to put up with that. But these people, we don't have to. We sit there in our gilded chamber and we couldn't give a damn. <laughs> and um, so what, what I think it will, will if, and I think it's pretty um, gloomy in the future if we can't start talking about it, talking about Islam, um, and then it might spill over in, into the Muslim community and give them more of a chance of standing up against their violent, their violent co-religionists as, 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 as on the terrorist front and the grooming gang lot on, on, on this front. So if we don't see anything, if we don't see any change, if the, if the government don't wake up, what do you see for the Well, I see riots. You of see course riots. there'll be riots. I mean, if you look, I mean, today, at the, and I've met them, and they're wonderful people. If you look at the veterans against terrorism and the football lads against terrorism, um, I mean, these are serious, real people. Um, and they have marched. They have marched, I think 74,000 of them marched in London uh, recently. It was an entirely peaceful march. They don't have racists, etc., etc., etc. But on one of those, one, one of them told me that on one of those marches there was a BBC camera crew uh, and a Sky camera crew. And they said to the people in charge of the crew, Well, this is really good. You're going to give us some coverage. And the BBC uh, chap replied, um, Well, we're not unless there's a riot. I mean, we, we've, got to, we, we've got to have friction, um, and so otherwise we're not going to cover it because it's just too boring. And this chap was very bright, then he said to the BBC man, and I suppose if there is a riot and you cover it, if there is a fight, if a fight does break out, we will be guilty of hate crime. We, the master. And the BBC said, you've got it, mate. You've got it. I was there, I was there. And the, the, the media, that's what I was going to, I'd like to ask you, what do you see as the media? What do you see as their responsibility in what's currently happening? With regards to the British public, what I'd say is being deceived about what Islamism and the problems in our country, what role do you think the media have played in that? Well, uh, the media, I tend to focus on the, the sort of main channels, and I do quite a lot of work on the BBC's coverage of Brexit, which is a scandal, uh, because the chairman and director general of the BBC cannot send me and my little group of cross-party MPs, they cannot send us the transcript of a single BBC programme since the referendum, which has examined the opportunities of Brexit. Not promoted, I think, just examined. They can't do it. There isn't one. They haven't done it. There isn't one. The BBC is the Guardian newspaper of the airwaves, really. That's what it is. And um, so what do I see the media doing? The media at the moment, I, I, the BBC, that absolutely no hope at all. Um, we haven't got a Fox television here or something of that kind. And um, so I don't think, do we? It's funny you say that because that's actually what I want to launch into now. We want, we want to become a media brand, yeah. the alternative media brand for, for the UK yeah. and for Europe to give people the truth, to bring them the facts. Well, at least to give them the opportunity to talk about it and decide for themselves, instead of being told uh, that these people who are making your life such a misery and blowing us up all over the place, th these are peaceful people and Islam is not the cause of it. What I want to go into and have a look at Islam and say to what if and to what extent is Islam the, 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 um, the cause of it? I don't see Are how you, you could say, and even the Archbishop of Canterbury, bless him, um, in, 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 in France, the September before last, and, and to a meeting of schools in this country, the Archbishop of Canterbury did actually say, we will never um, deal with Islamism, and come, uh, with Islamism unless we understand Islam. He said it is very unhelpful if we go on pretending that ISIS has nothing to do with Islam. And he also said, it's time for our religious leaders to stand up and be counted. Now, he said that the September before last, and it's got nowhere. I don't think he's going to say it again. The bishop who spoke today in the House of Lords, he certainly didn't take that. Oh. And he was very he? naughty, the bishop in the House, because you're supposed to get up and ask a question, a short question. He got up and made a speech. 
And in doing so, he cut out one or two people who might have supported me. Can I ask you, how many, is it a lonely voice? I, I've watched myself, just personally. Yeah. Personally, I've watched myself. I've, I've followed the comments you've given, the questions you've asked, because if I'm honest, you're the only person mm. I've seen mm. within the political spectrum that wants to talk about Islam. So, yes, so no, are, there, are there other people? No, I think I'm the only member of either House of Parliament since I think it was 1923 when Churchill talked about Mohammedans in a, in a, in a fairly objective fashion. Um, and th there are people, there's, there's um, the Baroness Cox, for instance, who's doing wonderful work um, on Sharia law yeah. and on the treatment of Muslim women under Sharia law and, and all the rest of it. Uh, and so she is doing, and, and on um, honor-based violence and that sort of thing, she's taking the lead on that. She's had three bills in the Lords, three second readings um, over the last three or four years, all of them brilliant debates, everyone <laughs> in the debate agreeing with her about Sharia law and its treatment of women and gays and so on. Um, and she's been supported by everyone except the government and the bishops of the Church of England. Okay. Well, and why do you think that is? Because what I've been what I've been telling you, because they just cannot bring themselves to look, to dare to look at what this thing might really be. Because they don't, because they won't know what to do with it. They wouldn't know what to do with it. No. And it, if they accept, it, if they accept the reality of what we know. Well, yes. I mean, they'd have to do all sorts of things. I, I think you'd first of all you'd have to begin to learn what's going on in our mosques, the sermons. I mean, I personally would in, require every sermon to be made in English so that we could understand it. I would think we should be told, or we should be able to find out what is going on in our madrasas. Um, but we can't, um, because um, I asked a question of the government the other day, and they admitted, no, we don't, we don't even really know how many madrasas there are. We certainly don't know what's going on in them, and what's more, we couldn't care less. I would have written an answer to that effect. I mean, not quite in that language. But, that's, course, but that's, that's where we are. Which, when we had four successful terrorist attacks last year and 12 prevented, right. when we had four yeah, successful yeah. terrorist attacks and 12 prevented, yeah. that is criminal. It's criminal that our government not willing and to... And, of course, at the madrasas are where the whole thing is being fermented and fermented for the... Whatever it is, 40% of Muslims in this country are under the age of 15, uh, against 6 or 7% of us. The whole thing is... You know, I, I think it's, unless we all wake up, unless these great movements, unless the football lads and the, uh, and, 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 and the veterans and everything can get themselves I organised into a political movement, and obviously I think, I, personally, the only thing I think they can do is to join UKIP, because UKIP is the only political party that will take this on in any way at all. You, you think currently UKIP now, yeah. under Gerard Batten's leadership, yeah. Exactly. would take on and yeah. give the working yeah. class people a yeah. voice against Islam. I mean, I, I've told them, you know, you can walk as, you can march as much as you want. I mean, a million people uh, marched against the Iraq war. I can't remember how many marched uh, uh, in the Countryside Alliance uh, uh, walk. Nobody gave a damn. Fox hunting was still banned and Tony Blair merrily sailed into Iraq and caused the complete file up of the whole of that part of the world. Uh, in doing so, which some of us could see, and, but th they won't say so the only thing that can be done is to get um, your followers and, as I say, the, the, the veterans and, 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 and the, um, the football lads and, and so on. They have got, and I really think the best thing they can do is join UKIP, give Gerard a run. Gerard is signed on Islam, has been for years. Uh, quite a few of the other people in UKIP aren't, for one reason or another. Um, but Gerard is, and then the National Executive Committee is behind him, and he's got a real fight on his hand. He needs money. Uh, if these people can change, and or, you know, these are real people. This should be a movement of real people funneled through a political party, because own these people, the chap lot you were looking at, and the House of Commons and David Cameron and all that lot, and Theresa May, they're not going to do anything about this until they fear they might lose their seats. They need to be replaced. So if we look across Europe, yeah. if we look at just what happened in, I in Italy with the elections, if yeah. we look to Austria, if we look to Sweden, wherever we look, the fastest growing political parties in every country are the anti-Islam political parties. And anti-EU. And anti-EU. Yeah. It goes together. Now in, yeah. now in Britain, we don't have one, yeah. but you, gen you believe that under Gerard Batten's leadership, UKIP could become that choice I do. for the people. I, I do, I know him, I've known him for many years. Um, I mean, UKIP is not for sheep. 
uh, UKIP is for individuals and people. So obviously it, it has its difficulties and after all I, I posed as leader of it in the 2010 Army. election so I know a bit about it. And, but they are, you know, the real people out there, the real sort of, sort of the earth are still members of, 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 of UKIP. And if it can get, a, a, and if you look at the, I don't know, I think they're supposed to be a million followers, are there, of the football lads and the veterans and other people there. Now that's the sort of thing we need to get into, in, 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 into UKIP. And then we can change things. Then we can say, um, you know, we're not going to on, go on with this. Not, not being, we're not being allowed free speech on this. That's one of the points I want to make. I, I believe completely Britain is primed for a UKIP led by someone who's going to take on Islam. Britain's yeah. ready, yeah, I, but I don't I, think people within the party realise that. I think Gerard, Gerard, Gerard has, Gerard's always been sound. I mean, Nigel was always a bit windy about uh, Islam, quite frankly, and, and the others, I mean, Bolton, who cares? Um, but uh, Nigel had a great, uh, he wanted to focus on one job, which was to get us out of the EU, and that he did brilliantly. Exactly. He did brilliantly. Yeah. I mean, he deserves a dukedom, and yeah. I don't know half the domains of Europe for his person. He's won. He's done incredibly well. But um, Gerard is the man on Islam. If if um, in Islam, it gives me it gives me a bit of hope hearing that. Yeah, well, I, I believe so. Well, tell me what else there is. Oh, no, no, Who else? I'd is like there? to talk to Gerard. If I, <laughs> and well, something I see is is currently dangerous. So they've got to join. They've got to sign up got and pay up. their subscriptions and UKIP will have the money and all the rest of it. Because there'll, be, there'll be a leadership vote coming up soon for well, UKIP. Well, he's there for whatever it was, 90 days. And it, but if Gerard has got enough money in and got, got enough members in, I don't think anyone will dare to challenge him. And if they do, he'll win. Hopefully. Because he can, yeah, well, he will. Yeah, I mean, if he doesn't, I don't know, Tommy, go and start your own party. But I tell you, it's an expensive business. No, no. It takes millions and millions to build up a brand image. I mean, I looked at changing UKIP's name in 2010, and it was going to cost 22 million then. So, you know, and I'm really glad we didn't. Um, Can, and something I see as dangerous is the attack on free speech in the UK. Hmm. So this last weekend, when, when a couple tried to fly into the UK, we had Martin Selner and Brittany Pettibone. Martin Selner was due to speak at Speaker's Corner. He was stopped and prevented from coming in. Brittany Pettibone was coming to interview me. The reason she was not allowed in to our country, they were held in a detention centre, put in prison for three days and deported. We're seeing this growing and growing and growing. Anyone who has a political opinion or voices their concerns of Islam seem to be getting the full weight of the state. We've just seen, again, two, day, two days ago, we've seen Lauren Southern, who's a Canadian journalist, and the reason they gave her why she's banned, now banned from the UK was the installation of blasphemy laws, medieval blasphemy laws, because she criticises Islam. Where do you see that taking us? It could, where, yeah, where, where do you see that? Well, it's taking us down the road to fascism, clearly, um, because it's one of the hallmarks of fascism. And, um, I mean, I've, we've been doing this in, in, in the Lords too. I mean, it seems that the, um, the Crown Prosecution Service has abrogated to itself powers of arrest under hate crime which are not actually supported in statute. And Lord Vinson, who's a colleague of mine, he raised this in, in, in an oral question in the Lords on the 5th of, 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 of December last year, and the government was you know, shilly-shallying around and avoiding the question. So I got up and simply said, could they be absolutely precise? Um, could they assure us that a, a Christian, a, a, a Christian preacher who was preaching um, the divinity of Christ um, as, and, and as superior uh, to any other religion and that Jesus was the only son of the one true God. I said, if someone gets on there, can the minister guarantee that he won't be arrested for hate crime? He, she refused to answer the question. Because she can't, because under the new hate crime, hate yeah, crime laws, yeah, if someone yeah, feels yeah, offended... Yeah, yeah. My, my question today um, could well be hate crime outside, but I spoke under privilege in the laws. They can't arrest me for what I said in that. They can arrest me for what I say here. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't care if they do. It should, you know, rather prove one's point. <laughs> for me, yeah, for me, it's in, for me, it's interesting to hear that they're warning you about raising questions or speaking about Islam because they believe you'll put the palace in danger. So it's that that seems to be the common theme, whether it be the grooming gangs, whether it be well, the and victimise <coughs> and really be unkind and brutal and racist. Um, towards our peaceful, mild Muslim friends, who they see wandering around, you know, all being peaceful and so on. 
<coughs> playing at the mosque, but they don't seem to... In Islam, we're dealing with something vibrant and alive. Just look at the mosques on a Friday. Look at Church of England on a Sunday. I mean, come on. You should see that this thing's coming. It means business. I agree. It's scary times ahead. <laughs> Dark times ahead. But thanks. Not at all. Thank you very much, Tommy. Be good, huh? I'll be good, I will. <laughs> Make sure that goes on. <laughs> <laughs> be good, you're not to be naughty anymore. Because I'm saying, yes, Tommy was a bit of a naughty boy, but yeah. now he's going straight and he's right. And that's what, and that's what I, <laughs> I just want to say a personal thank you to every single person who supported me. I couldn't bring you these videos without your support. We have no big funders, no big donators. So this is literally by you for you. So I want to say a personal thank you, and if anyone else wants to keep up to date with what we're doing, we've got plenty of exciting things coming up now, I've gone independent, you can do so at tommyrobinson.online. Thank you.